Right. Hopefully. Hey, okay, there you are. Oh, you I'm so sorry. Yeah. I don't know. It said video ended. Yes, I can hear you and I can see you okay. as well. Well, let's see. Where were we? We were talking about the pressures that are same, causing same language to... shift. Yeah. Yeah, I think you were talking about the pressures causing yes, shift away from uh, like monolingual. Well, Yes. Well, I said that mo the vast majority of speakers live in the cities or urbanized areas, what we call big cities, where Spanish is the dominant language. They speak Spanish very well, and they speak Quechua as well, even though they don't use it uh, as much as Spanish. Well, they, there are a lot of speakers just like that, but there are very, very few speakers who are well, and to me, monolinguals are all elders, all elders living in rural areas, and kids are in those languages because kids have migrated to a bigger town or to the city. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, um, monolingual varieties are in danger of disappearing as towns decrease in population. Mm -hmm. And there, there we will not have records left about those varieties and their speech particularly. Those varieties are highly endangered. And to me, as a linguist, those varieties are also different. We don't know anything about the system or how they work. And something that I was doing this, like, like I'm documenting the speech elders and I'm analyzing the morphology of of their verbs because I want to understand that and I have done some comparative work as well comparing uh, with the speech of bilinguals in order to show that these varieties are different mm -hmm. and we should consider monolinguals as another but a new variety that has not been taken into account um, because it's priorities given to only the varieties that are spoken in the city. Mm -hmm. And most research has been conducted with those varieties as well. And that's what I was doing. And also, I think the reason is like, since they live in the city and everything goes in Spanish, well, Spanish is the dominant language. Yeah, okay, there you go. You broke up for a yeah. second, now I can hear you again. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think a lot of folks may share that same mm -hmm. experience of watching young people move away from smaller towns and villages to go to the city where there's a dominant language, usually a colonial language, that influences the way they speak. And you'll find a totally different kind of language used in the villages, and that is becoming rarer and rarer. And so you grew up in a, in a village, right? Yeah. And so I assume. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was born and. What you assume? Oh, what? I assume at some point you you left for the city like other young people do. So what was your what was your language journey like as a younger person? Uh oh, are you still there? I can't hear you. No, nope, you can't hear me either. Oh, no. Um, maybe if we turn off cameras, do you want to try that? See if the audio will work? No, hang on. Let's see, maybe you'll see that. We can try that. Uh oh, sorry, folks, we're just having some technical difficulties. Let's 
Let's see, we're trying to get Gladys's audio back. Can you hear me now? Nope, can't hear you. Oh no. Hmm. Hey folks, can anyone else hear Gladys or is it just me that can't hear her? Ah, okay, maybe we're gonna, we're going to end this stream and start again. I uh, will let her know in the chat. Maybe she'll see it. Okay. Yeah, Sheridan. Yeah, I can't hear Gladys either. So we're going to restart the stream and hopefully that will fix it. We will be right back and I will save this live so that we can watch part one later. Okay, we're going to restart. Be back in one second, everybody. Okay, folks, let's see if we can make this work this time. Hopefully Gladys's connection will allow us to keep talking because this is a really interesting conversation. Let's see if we can get her back on here. All right, let's try again. Hopefully we'll be able to hear her. Cross. And don't worry if we can't make this work this time. We'll try. We'll try again via Zoom or something. Oh, are you there, Gladys? Yes, I'm here. There you are! Yay! All right. I can hear you now a little bit. You're kind of choppy, but I hear you. Uh, I, I, it's so difficult. This, I don't know what's. <laughs> yeah, this is not this is not going uh, very smoothly. Cool. Yeah, maybe next time we'll try like Zoom or something. Instagram is a little difficult sometimes with slow internet. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay. Sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't hear you, but. Uh, yeah, I can hear you, but it's it's really choppy. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Let's try. Let's try to keep it going. Uh, so, yeah, you were saying that mm -hmm. you grew up in a rural area. How can I and... solve the problem? Hmm. If you turn off your camera, do you think it would save up more bandwidth? Yeah. Do you want to try that? Yes, I I was born and raised in a rural area outside of Can you hear me? Yeah, that's much better. Turn yeah, that's off better now. now. My video camera. Can you hear me better? No, no problem. Okay. Yeah, so you were well, born, yeah, you're telling us where yeah, you were we born. Were, uh, yeah, you were. Yeah, I was born in Calayusta. It's a rural town in the city of Ochabamba, but outside the city. Um, and yeah, my parents work the land there. They still work the land. And so when you were a kid, did you mostly speak Quechua in your family or also Spanish? Yeah, I, well, Quechua was my first language and yeah, I spoke Quechua mostly. And, and, and at school is where I, where I learned Spanish. Okay, so how old were you when you first learned Spanish? I think about five or six. Six. Hmm. Oh wow! So yeah, that was like a whole childhood of just Quechua, and so yeah, oh. probably yeah. I think that's the case. Like kids uh, who 
who are born in rural towns, they they learn Quechua as their first language. And then when they enter school, they learn Spanish. Mm, cool. And so when... But these days, there are very, very few... These days, there are very few towns where where we still have kids learning Quechua as a first language. Mm. Okay, so you're you're kind of a rarity now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So you went to school, you learned Spanish, and at some point you got involved in linguistics. How did that happen? Um, well, in in Cochabamba, in the city of Cochabamba, I my BA was in applied linguistics. Um, there, when I, yeah, that's how I got involved in linguistics and I, and I wanted to learn more about linguistics and I ended up doing a, a master's and I think that's how it happened. But in 2013, when I graduated, I wrote a novel based on my grandfather's story and so I consider my grandfather a talented storyteller, wonderful stories. And then, uh, and also his life experience was very interesting. And then I, I was inspired by that. I should write a novel on, and he's actually the main character. Wow. <laughs> and, and so this novel is in Quechua, right? Yeah, the first novel, yes, that's in, uh, written in Quechua. And later on, it was translated into English. And it's available, freely available to the public now. That is awesome. We're, we're definitely going to post a link to that afterwards. But I just want to back up a minute. So yeah. you say this so casually. I just decided to write a novel and did it. That's, that's pretty impressive. Was there a moment in your life when you realized you wanted to work with your own language that really lit this flame for you to do this kind of work? Or did you always know that you wanted to work on your language? I think that started with the, with, I think that started with the novel. Um, yeah, my grandfather, from my father's side, he passed away. And all... All what I remember was his stories, and and so his uh, so he he like I said earlier like he was a talented storyteller. I all what I remember was his stories and also his life experience. He used to narrate for me. There was a in nineteen fifth in the nineteen fifties. There was a war that. Uh, the political government and other authorities took indigenous people from rural areas mm -hmm. and he was part of that so he went to a local war that they had and uh, to it was about the land and other political problems and I said well I should write a novel and that's how I really started getting involved in in Quechua writing and after that, I also, well, I, I, I want to keep writing in Quechua because there are lots of wonderful stories in mm. Quechua that I want to preserve them. That's incredible. So when you were doing your degree in applied linguistics, were you working on Spanish or other languages or did you start out there with Quechua? Well, in Bolivia, we have applied linguistics programs, but we really don't have a, um, an area where we can specialize in doing research in uh, grammar mm -hmm. on any language. It's more focused on how methodologies should go. Mm -hmm. And we have very the basics of linguistics, and, and I wanted to learn more about that part mm -hmm. and apply to Quechua but we don't have that in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. That's also the reason in, when I started my PhD in 2016, I wanted to teach Quechua in, well, not Quechua. I wanted to teach linguistics in Bolivia because that's 
in the area that we are not strong in. Um, and well, and then in 2016, we started organizing linguistic courses to teach students of applied linguistics. Most of them are speakers of native, native language, such as Aymara or Quechua. And that has grown a lot to, to date. We have a bigger team and we keep teaching linguistics and we are in, in a certain way changing like the view of what linguistics is and what's the study of linguistics. And we encourage like native speakers of different indigenous languages of Bolivia to work um, in their native languages and to work in language revitalization on their native languages. That is incredible. Yeah, the initiative that Gladys is describing is the Linguistic Summer School of Bolivia. And you should go check it out at lssbolivia.com. How did this program run? What kind of courses did you teach? Who were the instructors? I'm sure we have a lot of folks in the audience who might be yeah. interested in doing something similar in their country. Yes, uh, well, it started 2016. And since I started my PhD, well, I, I met a lot of people, a lot of linguists in the US and also, well, they became my friends and they learn about my initiative and and I would say whenever you you stop by Bolivia you should come teach and they were like very happy and well since I was a first year PhD student <laughs> and well I had a chance to meet a lot of people or linguists who were doing research in Bolivia or in Latin America and they were spending their summer somewhere in Latin America and they would stop in Bolivia to teach a course for free. Well, courses in our in the history of the Linguistic Summer School Bolivia have been taught by um, linguists doing research in Latin America. Uh, most of them like from different parts of the world like Canada, US or Europe. And the courses that we offer pretty much involve introduction to linguistics and also field method field methods courses because we with so many languages but we don't know how to start a documentation or a language description research and in a field methods class we teach how the process is and for instance last time before COVID in 2019 we had Mm, we had our courses in person and that happened in La Paz. We made fly two native speakers from the Amazonia. One was a speaker of Chacobo and the other one was a speaker of More. He, there, there are very, very few speakers of More. I think there are two fluent speakers, if I'm not wrong of that language but we we made fly uh, we brought him from the amazonia to la paz and our invited professor shall he and he taught the film methods class so student, well they were students were not only from la paz there were other students from other parts of the country as well so they can see and learn from the basics how we can start doing research and studying a language from zero. And I, and I think most of the students were very happy to see that because we do not have, in the history of Bolivia, we didn't have a field methods class like that before. Yeah, that's amazing. What a really cool thing to offer to folks starting in 2016, like that being the first time that a field methods course was available in Bolivia is huge. And so what do you think that most yes. students have What's learning of these my... basics? Hmm? Oh, say again, please. Sorry. What do you think most of the students at the linguistic summer school have for their goals for their language? Like, what what do you hope they will go on to do after getting this training? 
I can give example. I can give examples of some of our former students. Mm, one of the first ones, well, Gabriel Gallinate. He he was a student. I met him since he was a student. Um, he really got inspired with our courses, and he for his BA, I think in Cochabamba City, he was the first student who did a really, really in-depth study with one Amazonian language, Maropa, and his dissertation was published. And later on, he entered the PhD in linguistics at the University of Texas, and he will be studying his PhD next academic year. Yay, congratulations. The other, uh, there's also a yeah, there's another student, Oscar Rojas Villarreal. He was also he's also a former student, and he also got inspired. and He's a native speaker of Quechua, and he was my collaborator for my own research. And he also entered the PhD in linguistics, and he will be studying his ling his PhD. But there are a lot of students who who are motivated, who would like to pursue grad studies. Or there are also uh, other, other students and people who attended our courses, they are applying the tools they, they have learned. For example, in 2018, our courses were in Santa Cruz, mm -hmm. and another city where the plurinational state of... Um, also, there's one center, center of, for research of indigenous languages and I think they get benefits uh, from learning the different tools such as Elan or or what we have taught and they they are applying those those programs in their work um, I guess <laughs> well, that's, there were a lot of well, most of our students were from that institution and they also get the benefit like seeing how a uh, field method course is taught. And I'm pretty sure that's helpful in their research because for the plurinational state institution, they need to do research on indigenous languages and design alphabets uh, or things like that. Uh, actually, one of our courses in 2019, it was how to design orthographies for indigenous languages. Our professor was Kelsey Neely from the University of Berkeley in California, and he and she was involved in orthography designs in Peru. She actually does research with the language spoken in the Amazonia, in the Amazonian side of Peru. That's so cool. It sounds like, yeah, your mentorship and, and education for so many linguistic students in Bolivia has led a lot of them to go into graduate studies or to do their own research and revitalization work. And that's so cool. Congratulations. I, uh, I was wondering, what is, you've done so many things in language revitalization and research, right? You are a novelist, you are a researcher, you're a teacher, you are a speaker, so many other things. Are there any of your own language revitalization projects that are especially dear to your heart that really have a, a special place for you? Oh, I don't know. I think all of them are very important to me. <laughs> and <laughs> I, Yeah, I can't make you choose. It's like asking someone to pick their favorite of their children or something, huh? <laughs> okay, so that's not yeah. fair. But if we're talking about big picture goals, with all of the work that you're doing, what is your dream for the state of Quechua in 20 years? If, if you could, you know, snap your fingers and create your perfect future for the Quechua language, what would it be? Well, I hope Quechua doesn't disappear in 20 years. Well, that's it's it's a reality that monolingual varieties will do mm -hmm. and well to me as a linguist i would like to increase native speakers of quechua working and monolingual varieties so they can document preserve and we can conduct a lot of comparative studies mm -hmm. 
uh, linguistic studies. And also, like, I consider like doing uh, linguistic re research very important and crucial in order to teach it Quechua properly. But it, because if we don't, do not understand the grammar, we will not be able to teach. That was my case before when I graduated from my BA, I wouldn't be able to explain the morphology of Quechua or what certain suffix means. And that will be very hard if we do not understand the grammar. <laughs> we will not be able to explain, uh, to teach Quechua properly. But that's why we need studies on linguistic studies on Quechua mm -hmm. and um, improve our teaching methodologies uh, and also re use those materials to revitalize the Quechua, the Quechua varieties and the linguistic diversity of Quechua. Well, I hope we we gain more native speakers, Quechua native speakers from rural towns or from the cities, but they are committed mm -hmm. to work with monolingual Quechua and they and we keep a lot of records of monolingual speech and and we can use those those recordings or those materials in order to create different resources for Quechua language teaching. I would like to to have Quechua programs teaching to kids or to other communities uh, properly. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps properly is not like uh, the right word, but to have many native speakers yeah. teaching yeah, that's the language and that's a good point you bring up when you say properly, when it comes to teaching an indigenous language properly, what does that mean to you? What is so special about the Quechua spoken by monolingual elders? Is it just the grammar? Is it just the vocabulary? Or is there additional knowledge and culture wrapped up in the language of monolingual elders for you? Uh, well, yes, that's, I think that's the point that I wanted to make. Um, from my own research, what I have observed the like monolingual Quechua, they have um, like expressions. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting to me. And, well, that's only observed in, in the way elders speak, because mm -hmm. youngers do not speak like that. And and I would like to include those ways in order to um, to have to have a better understanding of the linguistic diversity of Quechua, and also the the verbs. Well, Quechua is a is a polysynthetic language, like it's kind of Spanish. But well, in English we can say she eats, right? We add the s, and that means we are talking about third person singular, uh, singular right? But uh, we say I eat, you eat. The 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 eat doesn't change. Mm -hmm. But in Quechua, it's kind of the third person she eats, but it's even more elaborate. We have a lot of suffixes, and something that I have observed is like monolinguals have more of suffixes in their verbs and they express other nuances and those nuances can be associated with emotion or affection or the or the way the verb is is performed or other nuances like that and if you analyze from a linguistic perspective you will not be able to explain or teach it properly. That was my case. When I finished my, my BA, I wouldn't be <laughs> able to explain a very elaborate or condensed verb form to another student who does not speak Quechua mm -hmm. or who is willing to speak Quechua or learn Quechua. And well, I, w I was a native speaker, but that didn't make me aware of the grammar of Quechua. 
so I am able to explain, oh, this morpheme means affection. Yeah. And when you have this other morpheme after this other morpheme, that means you are making love someone to someone. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to explain that. But if we learn about the grammar, we will be able to that. And that's what I mean when I say properly. Yeah, that's a really important point, right? Speaking a language perfectly, even as a, a fully fluent native speaker, does not mean you can analyze it. Sometimes that takes a little extra training. And you're right, it's so important to be able to do that analysis to keep that knowledge of how a language functions so that you can teach it to new speakers. So thank you for putting that so clearly. Yeah, and if, if, we, if we train, like, well, teachers in Bolivia who teach Quechua, well, even though they are native speakers of Quechua, well, they do not have this understanding. But if we increase native speakers, like Quechua speakers, doing linguistic research, we will have a lot of material, a lot of resources, so teachers can use it and can apply in their classrooms, and then we are teaching Quechua properly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like you've done a lot of work to sort of support speakers and learners of indigenous languages who want to get involved in linguistic analysis and research. So I was wondering if you had any words of encouragement for other speakers of indigenous languages who want to get involved in linguistics, like what advice would you give? Wow. That's a big what question. advice I would I give to them? I think like a couple of days ago, we were discussing with my colleague, Gabriel Gallinate, well, how can we increase native speakers of, <laughs> of um, indigenous languages of Bolivia to pursue linguistic studies and to really work on their native language? I think most of the speakers are, um, uh, if you encourage them, they will, they are pre perhaps most interested in doing language revitalization. Mm -hmm. But uh, finding someone who is really committed to do linguistic research is a little bit hard. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, in Bolivia, we, we do not know about linguistics as a field. And that's a challenge. But uh, something that that not worked like people who are studying like applied linguistics or literature um offering them courses or showing them the value of linguistics or people or teachers like let's say teachers of indigenous languages uh, they teach the language but they do not have the training um showing them what the linguistics field is, I think it can be a motivation to get more interested and get involved in linguistic studies. Yeah, for sure. And I guess if, do you know of any resources that are available for anyone watching who might want to get some first steps into linguistics? Uh, what what do you mean, like linguistic content? Yeah, like they maybe should check out lssbolivia.com. Uh, yeah, if they want to learn about our own trajectory and experiences, yeah, they can they can check our webpage, the lssb.com, and also we have a Facebook page. It's Linguistic Summer School Bolivia, and we are posting all the time, like, things, workshops are related to, to linguistics. And something that we have been doing, like, last year is, like, offering virtual uh, linguistic talks. Um, we have been inviting speakers from, from other countries who do linguistic work so they can give special talks about um, linguistic research or language and policy and or historical linguistics. So other native speakers of Bolivia or non-native speakers of Bolivia 
can get motivated in linguistic work and they learn about the value of of linguistic work and revitalization so and we we also have a youtube channel with our talks in there oh. and we hosted one special session that's uh, native speaker pioneers doing linguistic research and also language revitalization in the americas and it's also in in our youtube channel they can check it out if they're interested about some ideas or our own trajectory that is fantastic yeah i will put a link in the bio uh, of this instagram page when we're done so that y'all can go check out those youtube videos and the lss website Thank um, you. yeah uh, and if anyone is also interested in learning about linguistics for language documentation uh, the endangered languages project has been offering a webinar for free on facebook so if you go on Facebook uh, and search for ELP language documentation webinar, you'll find a Facebook group there where you can learn some basics of documenting morphology and phonology and syntax and all that fun stuff. Um, and it sounds, Gladys, like there are people around the world doing really important work to make this kind of linguistic training more accessible. A really sincere thank you for all of your work making linguistics easier to get into for people who want to work on their own languages so thank you wait i, I think no, uh, thank you. is is thank you in quechua pachi uh i don't know where pachi comes from but i have heard that some people say pachi that and some people in the rural areas would say uh, the syncretism form, Dios uh, pagará pusungi, may pay for you, or mm -hmm. something like that, or just say gracias. Well, gracias, and I, what was the longer phrase? Dios pagará pusungi. <laughs> <laughs> Dios pagará pus, wow, I don't even speak Spanish. I'm, I tried. Uh, but Gladys, I want to say but, thank you. Rap no thanks yeah no thanks to you and i'm so sorry it didn't work out with my internet or something's wrong with <laughs> no it's okay we made it work do you want to turn on your camera to say a few words of goodbye you could even say a goodbye in quechua if you'd like to everyone who joined in us quechua? um no um uh, anchata agradecer Kai anawam palaricus raiguta uyarimus raichimanta noga wajarita monaiman astawan picunach kai bolivia bolivia pi quechua simita parlangu chai parlacunata maeren ayumanta chusu maeren pueblito mantach kangu paiguna astawan yang arinanguta Hesho Siminguwa, Chantam Sastam Kalpacharinanguta Munaima, Imentach Awalit Ninch Awalit Ninch Kechota Parla Kungu, Paiguna Imentach Palangu Chaita, Stam Halch Anakachum, Porque Paiguna Wanyupungera, Unchai Palayacha Kusranguta Apakapungangu, Ni Imata Yachat Sumanya Chamantarai, Chet Siyaki Kanga, Chayat Nora Niri, Menchantaps Wakuna Nach Astam. Simingupa, Yang Arikui Munangu Chaigunataga, Luachungu, Ahnata Wa in Lenguas Indigenas Tawang, Kalpicharison, Ahnat Chaya Ana, Gracias. Wahkutikam Kachu. Thank you, Gladys. Gracias. Mahalo. Thank you, Akeva. It was wonderful to talk yeah. with you today. If anyone has questions for you, is it okay if they contact you? Yeah, they can contact me whenever they want. Yeah. <laughs> I think if they just go my name, my my email will pop up like that. Perfect. Or through Instagram as well, on, on Facebook. Feel free to send an email um, to the Linguistic Summit School Bolivia or uh, contact us through our 
Facebook page also uh, if if there's a linguist who's stopping by Bolivia at some point and wants to be part of the linguistics either giving it or teaching a course it's uh, he or she is more than welcome we love people we love working collaboratively and we have been doing great work thanks to our friends who are outsiders but uh, but we like them and because we can work very well in as a community beautiful thank you so much gladys it was a pleasure to talk with you and learn from you today thanks Hasta pronto.